uh, so we can go to the next slide. Of course, today is, uh, can, you can uh, flip uh, to the next uh, slides, please. There are a few videos, so bear with me and uh, can go to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Ayer, you can control, control the slides from your, your end also. Uh, I can. So do I just hit the... Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, obviously we are in a three-prong approach and I wanted to give you uh, the one therapy that has changed, has been a game changer. Dr. Agarwal talked about a game changer in CML. So is the case in uh, diffuse large basal lymphoma. Uh, a very different disease, obviously. So I want to give you an overview of that. Before doing that, the principles of immunotherapy that's taken us so long to get to the point of, uh, 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 of using the, the holy grail of immunotherapy. And uh, talk to you specifically about the autocar, especially the Zuma one, and, and uh, touch upon Juliet and Transcend, and also the management of CAR-T. Obviously, the CAR-T is yet to make its inroads in India, but there's a lot of excitement. I know there are groups, at least two groups in India that are trying to work uh, in Bombay and also in Bangalore that are trying to bring a CAR-T by early next year. That being said, uh, let me move this, I guess, in the right direction. So immunotherapy is a hallmark of cancer. This is uh, Hanahan and Weinberg's presentation of how the immune system is supposed to recognize and eliminate cancer, but many times, Obviously, we know now that uh, the cancer cells have a way to escape that. And what is required for this immune uh, recognition uh, is this two signal theory of, of uh, signal one, which is the class one with uh, encounters the antigen and the class two is the coastal military molecule. And the class one in this case is represented by the CD3 and its engagement of the right antigen. And the class two is represented by many coastal military molecules such as CD28, uh, 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 CD-137, uh, OX-40. These are all the coastal military molecules. Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, so the, the, the whole idea of CAR-T was developed. I think I'm moving the slides a bit too fast. Okay, here we go. The CAR-T development from discovery to FDA has been a long journey based on this two-signal approach. From the year 1980, from when Dr. Ishar in Israel first developed an antibody with a TCR and transfected into a cell, since then till the uh, work done by Carl June and Kokendoffer, uh, Steve Rosenberg, and came along uh, the, the, the various companies that outlicensed some of this work and, and with the idea of instead of taking a cell and trying to make it recognize class one and class two, why not transfect the, the class one and class two itself into an immune cell of the patient and give it. And that, with that idea, the CAR-T uh, came about and now we have at least two CAR-Ts approved in diffuse large piece cell lymphomas and one in mantle cell lymphoma. And the advantage of the CAR-T is actually independent antigen recognition. Therefore, it has a universal application. It's target-based. Initial approaches, iterative approach is single target-based, whether it's CD19 or BCMA, CD20, CD22, and the targets are increasing in number. Now we have dual CARs, triple CARs, multiple CARs. And you can generate these tumor-specific T cells in days to weeks. It's active for both CD4 and CD8 cells. There's a minimal risk of autoimmunity or GVHT, even in an allocar, and I'll show you, and it's a single treatment. There's not an instance where one single treatment can actually cure a treatment with active disease. Now, transplant can do that, but transplant, the principle, of course, is consolidation. Here, even with active disease, with single infusion, you have a living drug that is able to treat the disease. And the construct, this is, this is just an example of the construct of class one and class two. The class one, of course, is the TCR complex, which is represented by the CD3. And the class two is a coastal military molecule. But basically, what it needs is the specificity of the antibody target recognition. So in this case, this tumor-associated antigen, single-chain FV, is the target. And that, when you combine that with the, uh, with the, uh, the next, which is the effector mechanism of T cell, the class one, and the class two, you have a very powerful drug, so, so to say. The first generation just had the CD3, the second generation had the 
the combination with the coastal military domains such as CD28, 41BB, OX40. The third generation, which are on its way, consists of several coastal military domains along with the antigen and the CD3. We will stick uh, to the discussion on the second generation because that's where the approval is. And this tumor-associated antibody targeted uh, CAR T cells requires the construction of the CAR T gene. So if it's an autologous cell, obviously it has to be subcloned and expanded and given to the patient. And this is a process. And there, I don't want to spend time on the various antigens that, for example, the B cell lymphomas have. There are various antigens that can potentially go after, but 19 and 20, 20 and uh, even 22 and 79 are the ones that are uh, being considered at this point. And the first approval was based on this idea that a B cell, a, 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 this is a cartoon of how it gets attacked by the CAR T cells by recognizing the CD19 antigen. And the CD19 antigen is recognized by the CAR T. The CAR T comes very close, approximately to the B cell, and it kills the cell. And this is the story of, uh, of a young girl called Emily Whitehead. And the first study that is done by, uh, by St Stefan Group in uh, Pennsylvania that led to the cure potentially of this girl who had failed uh, uh, an allo transplant for ALL and no, with no other hope in sight. And that changed the way we looked at uh, the CAR Ts, obviously. And we've come a long way since 2014. I don't know if this, this cartoon is going to work. If it doesn't work, we can go on to the next slide. There are several viral vectors that allow the, these TCRs and antigens to be packaged into the cell. There's lentivirus, there's retrovirus. The lentivirus, there are advantages of one versus the other. There's some of the approaches used by, for example, the kite is a lentivirus. The Novartis drug Kimraya uses a retrovirus. Several groups like the Baylor group uses a retrovirus. And so you use a process called electroporation to push the, uh, the gene of interest to, with the viral uh, elements into the cell. And that's how that's the, the, the electroporation. Or sometimes you also do a transduction process, which is slight uh, variation of that. Uh, and the autologous CAR Ts uh, are the way to extract cells from the patient, sort of like a pharisees that happens, except that you don't uh, require uh, stem cells, you just take the nucleated cells and, and do the process of, uh, of electroporation with the vectors of choice. Uh, there, there are issues with that, this patient-to-patient -patient variability, it's, it's, it's time consuming. We have seen many patients disease actually progress while they're waiting for this three to four weeks. The initial timeline was about six weeks. Now it has come down to about three weeks. Uh, and there's also some commercial challenges. And for example, the Novartis compound, which is the Kimraya, the, the FDA has required a spec of 70% expression of the target. If it is less than 70%, it's called off spec. You also have to look for interferon release. And if the interferon release is not adequate, then the product comes back as, as not meeting the specifications. But that those are high standards. Now they're negotiating with the FDA to see if they can lower down to 60% or so. And, and still allow this to happen because despite 60% electroporation capabilities, the, the CAR T still seems to work. But there are these issues with autologous CAR T cells. And I just want to mention that allocars have changed and it's going to be the next wave. I won't show you much data on this. And the reason this is more uh, uh, germane is because you, we all heard about the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, the two ladies that won the Nobel Prize, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. So we actually are doing a study with an allocar, which allows us to select donors and have off-the-shelf cars and take out the car, the, the class one expression in the allocar so that there's no GVHD. And CRISPR-Cas9 obviously allows for this precise genome editing to happen. Uh, and it's a one-step multiplex editing to produce an allogeneic car. And you can in, you also put the genes of interest, in this case, the antigen and also the target. So that's one way of doing it. There is also an, another approach that is done by, uh, spearheaded by uh, Hari Parameshwaran, who you know very well. The current manufacturing process takes time. He uses a Milteni uh, technique that allows the, 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 the uh, live production of a closed system and creation of a CAR T that can be infused within about seven days. So the, uh, the, the CAR T that comes from CRISPR-Cas9 is highly efficient. It, the TCR knockdown, which, which eliminates the GVHT is almost close to 100%. The class one MHC knockdown, uh, knockout improves persistence. 
And in this case, sometimes beta two microglobulin is also knocked out so that it allows the expansion of the CAR T. So it's very exciting times, but in some ways we are with the auto cars. And I, I explained this to the patient wherein you, know, you have Robert Downey Jr. And when you do the CAR T process, it becomes Iron Man, or if you will, Clark Kent for an allo car, obviously becomes is a Superman. Uh, so you have two examples of an auto car with Robert Downey Jr. or with the Superman who comes from out of earth and is the actual allo car and still able to save the earth. And that's the analogy that I use. But I just wanted to go back to some of the clinical studies that have been done with uh, CAR T and diffuse large B cell lymphoma and with Zuma one and, and Juliet. As you all know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the diffuse large B cell lymphoma landscape has changed. But this, these are some of the few slides set to show where the effort of CAR-T currently is ongoing. Uh, most of the work is in China, and there are about 200 studies uh, and followed by the United States. Uh, the rest of Europe has about uh, 20 studies or so, and you can see that everything else is a gray uh, area without any activity, and that needs to Im improve, obviously, with collaborations. And uh, I won't spend much time on what we are doing, but we have done about uh, 250 to 300 CAR-Ts in various tumor types, including uh, CAR-T cells, TCRs, including NK CARs, uh, the, the, the ACTRs, uh, CTLs. And, and, and uh, we have uh, had the experience of not just in diffuse large B-cell, but also in other tumor types. So coming back to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, it's a second generation CAR with the uh, CD3 domain and uh, the co-stimulatory domain being either uh, C28 or 41BB. And the uh, CD28 domain obviously is the uh, Kite product and the 41BB is the Kimraya product. So we'll talk about uh, some of the data. We know about diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the most common lymphoid malignancy. The initial standard therapy is non-targeted cytotoxic therapy, but there's a 60% failure rate. And the second line standard therapy is largely ineffective uh, with 10% cure rate. And this comes from a scholar study that showed the patients who relapse after two lines of therapy have a poor cure rate and, and they succumb to the disease eventually. So not all of them can be cured. And this is the spectrum of the diffuse large B cell in, uh, that we won't spend much time on the biology, but there is the GCBs and the non-GCBs uh, and the high grade B cell lymphoma and the double expressive lymphomas and the non-GCBs that are unclassifiable. And the second attempt at is always a question of cure versus palliation, particularly after two lines of therapy, at least in the United States, beyond CAR-T, there are other approvals, including the CD79, polotuzumab. There is recently an approval of CD19 and monoclonal antibody, the Monjovi or the tafacitamab along with lenalidomide. So there are more op options, but CAR-T still remains as one of the most uh, uh, promising in the long-term data. And this is the data with the various CAR Ts. I put all the survival curves in one slide to show you that Zuma 1, the overall survival curve looks very promising. And the, the, the median of the four year data actually shows that it's about a 50% uh, uh, CR rates potentially translating into a cure. Juliet, very similar. The CR patients are the ones who live longer. Transcend is with the LISO cell, and I'll spend a few seconds on talking about that. And very similar data, which is not yet approved, but very likely will be approved uh, to uh, very soon. Okay. So, one PDF attachment? Okay. 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 But I wanted to talk to you about the Zuma 1 phase 2 study design, which is the Escarta or the Kite. It's a multi-center phase two study, which is in two cohorts. The cohort one was refractive diffuse large B cell. The second cohort was primary mediastinal uh, large B cell transform follicular lymphoma. And, and it had about 20. The, the majority of the patients were diffuse large B cell lymphoma. You can see the key inclusion. The treatment included leukopheresis, no bridging therapy. That's the important part. The patients were given a conditioning therapy of cytoxin and fludarabine to allow the cells to get, go in because previous studies had shown that without conditioning therapy, there were issues, either the, the CAR-Ts wouldn't work or there were toxicities with the CAR-Ts. The primary endpoint was overall survival rate and secondary endpoints are duration of response. So a, there, was, there was a pre-specified interim efficacy analysis in 50 patients. And you can see the data on the next slide. Can we move this uh, next slide, please? Ah, good. 
So this is the schema. If you look at the, uh, the schema of the CAR-T, and this is true for most CAR-Ts, you have leukapheresis, and that timeline is variable. Today, it's about 17 days for escarta. There is conditioning chemotherapy, so you start your day with minus five. It's three days of conditioning therapy of cytoxin and fludarabine, so day minus five, minus four, minus three. And sometimes we use growth factors on day minus, uh, minus two, minus one, and the patient is admitted overnight, so which means all of this is done as an outpatient. And day zero is the infusion. And then this toxicity monitoring that goes on for 30 days. I also mark this note for day 14 because most of the issues happen in the first two day, in the first two weeks after infusion. Why? Because the cells proliferate. And I tell the patients that each cell, so these cells are given in millions, about 100 million cells. Each cell multiplies by about 10,000. So it creates a lot of noise, creates a lot of cytokines. And the end of it around day 10 to day 14 is when it kills the target cells. So all the activity and the noise happens in the first two weeks and eventually the patient's uh, uh, potential side effects recover and then they're ready for assessment by day 30. Next slide, please. Okay, so the CAR-T expansion, as I told you, is about 10,000 times, and this is early studies that were done, and persistence after axicel uh, lasted for as long as a year, so, uh, with a median of about three months. Next slide. Sorry, uh, yes, sir, you can have the control over you. Okay, I'm not able to move the slides. Touch on the slide, sir. Oh, touch on the slide, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. This is the baseline characteristics of this uh, diffuse large B cell and the uh, and the primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma and the uh, follicular transformed lymphoma patients. Median prior therapies are at least three to four, with uh, with up to seven or twelve. The high IPA, IPA score is also high, and you can see that many of them are relapsed refractory entering into this phase. About twenty percent had prior transplants. And the Zuma responses at one and three months. You can see the initial responses. Uh, the best CRs were about 52%. Three-month CRs were about 39%. And the significant response of about 76% was versus the historic controls, which I showed you earlier, was a scholar study. It was about 20%. And so dramatic improvement. The CR rates with greater than three-month of follow-up deferred in patients between uh, uh, based on how they entered the, the treatment uh, uh, protocol, Re refractory to second line, about 47%. Post auto transplant, there were a small number of patients, but 75% of them achieved a CR. And the overall response rate was seen across the subgroups. If you look at refractory, uh, the IPI, the score, uh, and also, most importantly, because we'll talk about some of the side effects, the use of steroids or use of the anti-IL-6 antibody did not change the outcomes, and they still did fine with the treatments. The, CR, the safety, I'm going to spend a little bit more about the safety, but clearly the two things that stand out as side effects that requires admission for these patients are cytokine release syndrome and neurological toxicity. They are reversible, but they are almost seen in almost all the patients, 80 to 90% of the patients that uh, get this therapy. And there are some correlates. It has to do with the cell expansion. Uh, it also has to do with the disease burden. And those are the two main parameters that we see that correlates with CRS and to a large extent to the neurological side effects. And we have now great ideas. But I want to show you some clinical vignettes. So this is a 62-year-old male with diffuse large B cell went through this usual our chop our gdp our ice and also lenalidomide with rituxan no response to the last three lines of therapy this is the baseline and you can see the pet scan is completely turned negative and these are dramatic initial responses we are awed by it not anymore because we this has become the norm for patients who go on to receive car t's whether it's auto car t's or some of the allo car t's that we have and this is another example of a patient who had the skin lesions who actually was a patient who came from india with a lot of these skin lesions. And one month after the treatment, you can see the resolution of all these skin lesions, uh, which are all diffuse large piece of lymphoma. Uh, and the Zuma at follow-up at 15.4 months, you can see that 56% of the patients are alive. The overall survival was pretty impressive. And you start starting to see a flat line uh, at six months, 12 months, and 18 month mark. And now we have a four year uh, uh, follow-up data from LOC uh, 
uh, with Satvanilapu and Satvanilapu at MD Anderson led the study. It was published in England Journal of Medicine in 2017. So the 30% of the patients in remission at one year, uh, if you went back and looked at the CAR-T expression, they did not have the CAR-T. Uh, uh, but, uh, but clearly there were, there were patients where the CAR-Ts are still there, but still the durable, durable response was still present in patients without the CAR-T itself, telling us that the responses that are seen very early on were also durable. And this is, this is the impressive part about it, but there is something to do with the persistence of CAR-T and we don't know what that cutoff is, whether it is one month or two months or three months, but clearly what we're seeing as a pattern is that if the response lasts for at least three months to six months, I think they're good. Beyond six months, if the response persists uh, and they maintain a CR or even a PR, that's a good sign. But in anything less than three months, it, the biology is very different. And we're starting to come up with other strategies on how we can overcome some of these problems. Perhaps one of the problems is the, is the lack of persistence of the CAR-Ts at that point. And you can see this is the survival curve difference between scholar one, which is the historical control versus Zuma, and where you can see the curve has shifted up and more people are surviving. You can see a tail in the survival curve. And the multi-center, and this is just a slide to show you the, the various CAR-Ts that, are, that have been studied. The Zuma one is the one that I talked about. The Juliet is the Kimraya with a 4-1-BB, which has the retroviral and very similar response rates. And, the, and then the Transcend is the Liso cell, which is not yet approved, which will likely be approved this year. There are various parameters. I think the manufacturing successes are different. One of the things that we notice about the Novartis is the time taken for uh, production of this auto autologous cars takes a little longer. So for various reasons, since we started with Zuma and Kite, we continue to use Escarta. We use Novartis because the, the potential side effects with uh, Novartis, uh, the, uh, the, the CNS toxicities are slightly lesser. Uh, and we have not yet used Lysocell outside of clinical studies. So best responses are very comparable with all these, the, all these three uh, study sets. Uh, and if you look at some of the uh, uh, side effects, uh, uh, the, what is different about this is that the, the CRS seems to be similar across the board. The neurological toxicities seem to be a little lower for the Novartis and for the Lysocell. The advantage of Lysocell uh, which I will uh, don't have the data to show, but is that it can be given entirely as an outpatient because of some of the reduced CRS and the, some of the reduced neurological toxicity. Lisa cell uh, allows selection of CD4 and CD8 in a particular ratio. So the transfection, and they, uh, they also look at the, uh, uh, the uh, senescent T cells and remove the senescent T cells, which might also contribute to relapses. So there is some tinkering that goes on with the autologous T cells in the Lisa cell product. And we will see that that would potentially be used more in the future once it gets approved. So I want to spend some time on the, some of the side effects. And uh, cytokine release syndrome happens in uh, patients, as I told you, from day zero to the day 14 because of these cytokines. And the cytokines, there are different cytokines that come in waves at different time points. The first set of early phase cytokines are immune homeostatic when they are expanding the IL-2s, IL-7s, and IL-16s. Then you have the middle phase, which has inflammatory cytokines, which predominantly is an IL-6 mediated approach, and then you have the others. And then it shifts to your actual cytotoxic cytokines, which is the TNF-alpha and interferon gamma. And finally, it culminates in the granzymes and perforins, which actually allows the CAR-T to go into those uh, tumor cells and kill them. But the problem is in the middle phase with so the IL-6. That's where all the toxicities come from, in the middle phase and to some extent in the initial homeostatic phase because of another cytokine called IL-1 beta. So between IL-1 beta and IL-6, the reasons why you have this uh, toxicities. And this is just a snapshot of the cytokine storm and very good uh, data set that is collected. But if you look at some of the correlates, IL-6 levels is the one that correlates with the severity of CRS. IL-6 can be measured, but it takes time. And what is a surrogate for that? C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein in some ways also correlates with uh, CRS severity. And so we use that as a surrogate for IL-6. One other clinical surrogate that we often use is fever. And this is a good example of this 34-year-old patient with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma who went on to receive axis cell or escarta. It received the infusion. You can see that the temperature spike on day one, day three, and day five. And initially, there is a management protocol algorithm that we follow for CRS based on the ASTCT 
2017 guideline. But eventually, if the fever doesn't go away within 24 to 48 hours with Tylenol, and with uh, if it doesn't cause a grade two and beyond CRS, we use this anti-IL-6 antibody, tocilizumab preferably. And you can see after tocilizumab, the, the C-reactive protein goes down. So it's a good way to control the CRS when used very early on. The timing is very important. We don't use steroids for CRS unless there are other issues. And, uh, and the only reason to use CRS, uh, the steroids, is for, uh, for the neurological toxicities. Again, there is an association between CAR T expansion and response uh, and, and the uh, side effects potentially, including the CRS. So obviously, there is also uh, the other parameter, uh, which is the conditioning chemotherapy. Conditioning chemotherapy has been slowly tweaked. We use cytoxin and fludarabine. Some groups are using bendamustine. Some groups are actually using fludarabine and radiation, and there are new ones that are coming along. Some groups have also used high-dose cytoxin and fludarabine, and that is something that we use for an allocar because of the potential for GBHD and rejection. So there are all these parameters. One thing I have to say, the tocilizumab steroid use in these studies did not change the responses, but steroid use it affects the, uh, the neurological problems. So if, there are, if, there are, if you would prefer not to use steroids, you would not use steroids in our patients. Um, the one other parameter that also uh, uh, causes CRS is the disease burden, particularly in leukemia. In leukemia, the disease burden and also the compartmentalization of the blood, the cytokine storm is also much higher. And one of the ways that we monitor the neurological toxicity, it's now called ICANS, I-C-A-N-S, is by this mini mental status exam, which is now modified. One of the key things is handwriting. As you can see on day four at 9 a.m., that's the, the handwriting with a good score. At day five at 1.30 p.m., you can see the handwriting getting worse and the patient gets to solucimab. And, and some improvement, and by day 6, 9 a.m., you can see that the handwriting is, is back to normal. So it's very dramatic. It's very reversible. It's a dramatic phenomenon. And sometimes it is not so. We have to take the patients to the unit. We have to give them high-dose steroids. There are protocols for that. And we sometimes have to intubate them as well. We have to call the ophthalmologist and neuro-oncology, the neuro uh, neurology services to help us out, do EEGs and many things, and take them through a supportive care process. We have also found that HLH can also happen because these CAR T's are too powerful and these, uh, these CAR T's can start attacking the bone marrow and, and very, we've had instances where HLH have been very severe, which have been managed like an HLH that might happen in other situations. So I won't spend time, but there is a, this is the CAR Talks guidelines. We meet every week to talk about every patient that goes on CAR. This, uh, this is headed by the Satva Nilapu and Ijesh Paul who run the CARTOX committees, and it's a beautiful program. I think you, you can all have a chance to visit that. These are the treatment algorithms for CRS. I'll be able to answer any questions later on. Won't spend much time, but wanted to spend a few seconds on the patterns of failure. There is this patterns of failure that is seen in uh, patients who fail this within first month. First month of primary resistance, and there are responders for the most part, but even in the responders, there are patients who relapse early. It's about 20% of them. And there are people who relapse late. And even in the uh, uh, CRs, the durable CRs, about 40 to 50%, as I mentioned, the late relapses are beyond six months. They're about 5%. And the early relapses, the one between three to six months is about 15%. 15 They're all different reasons why it happens. And I won't spend time. And these are all the potential causes for the CAR T failure. It could be tumor related, could be the product itself. It could be the host features, uh, including the comorbidities. Microbiome is a big player in this. And th these are some of the markers that have been studied in uh, Zuma 1. Clearly, what was seen was this peak CAR and CAR AUC, which means the, the time it takes for the CAR-T to expand and the expansion and how high it remains. It seems to be one of the reasons as a marker for, for durability of response. And with different car products, you have different uh, answers. And obviously, this is something that is going to be investigated in the future. Primary resistance is a big problem for CAR-T. Even though 50% are cured, 50% are not cured. Again, we have this 50% problem with transplant. Now we have 50% problem with the CAR-Ts. And the primary resistance come in various shapes and forms. One such form is the overexpression of exhaustion markers, which is PDL one in the tumor type as a way to escape this CAR T. And there are many other reasons, including the BTK pathways. So we are combining them with uh, uh, 
uh, acalabrutinib, we are combining them with uh, tocilus, uh, with uh, 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 anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1 antibodies. Zuma-6 was a study uh, with an anti-PDL-1 uh, antibody. The data has yet to come out. And that being said, I think one of the ways to improve the efficacy of CAR-T is to try and understand what happens. And then yet there's another problem. There's antigen escape. CD19 negativity is a problem. And it's, it's seen in majority of the patients with this primary uh, uh, refractoriness. And we are trying to understand why this happens as well. And so one of the reasons is because the senescence of the CAR T's and also because the way the tumor itself edits its CD19. And the, uh, we have some strategies to make sure that the CD19 remains upregulated all the time. Well, another way to overcome this to have dual targets, CD19 and CD20 or even CD19, 20, and 22 as, uh, as triple targets. So there are many approaches that are being uh, ongoing right now. Off-the-shelf cars also are helpful. Uh, and we talked about the allo cars and the, the approaches taken by uh, Hari and others. Uh, there are advantages that are yet to be approved. Uh, there are obviously challenges with GVHD, but it's an exciting time for us to be in lymphoma, not just in lymphoma, but also in other tumor types, including solid tumors. And want to end with this uh, uh, 20, this should be 2020 CAR-T options. This is 2018. You have Zuma, Juliet, and the Transcend. Clearly, you have great options for diffuse large piece lymphoma through immune therapies. Now, beyond 2020 is the combination therapies. You have the uh, triple CARs. You have the, the multiple CARs. And then you have the ADRs, the allo-resistant uh, cars that can, are also applicable. And uh, the, with, being, with, with this being the case, you, we have demonstrated finally, after all these years, that the immune system can be harnessed. It's a dramatic responses in survival when treated with CAR-T. The, the toxicity is an issue, but it's great efficacy. And future CAR-Ts have to come up with lesser toxicity. There is durability of response. I think we are curing these patients. And uh, combinations is going to be the future. Sequences and combinations. And I'll stop here and be happy to answer any questions. Of course, this is the entire MD Anderson group. And I want to always point out this poem that we all learned at, uh, uh, with Robert Hutchison, the textbook of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, bedside uh, clinical medicine from making the cure of disease more grievous and the endurance of the same. Good Lord, deliver us. Thank you. The shortage of time, I think we can allow one or two questions and then, then Dr. Hammond will conclude it. Uh, can we have a one or two questions? Um, Dr. Dinesh, can I ask a question? This is Dr. Yes. Satin. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, yeah, that was a lucid talk. I've got two questions. The first one is uh, with the electroporation technique, what was the success rate of payload delivery? And the second question. Uh, when you see the difficult patients of uh, HLH and sometimes the neurotoxicity, is you or any of your group in the Europe or North America planning to induce a suicide gene where we can diffuse them? Thank you. Great, great questions. To answer your first question, yes, I think you saw the idea. I ran through the slides very quickly. The transfusion, the, the transfection or the electroporation efficiency varies. It's actually more than 95% in all the products that we have seen. Uh, these techniques have become very standard now and automated, so to say. So it's about 94% to 99%. Of course, what they do is they they electroporate and look at the efficiency, and then they they expand the, the ones that have been transfected. So initially, you might start with the 40% product, but then they enrich the 40% product to get it to 100%. So the second part is your uh, is the toxicity. So we've had situations where HLH is very bad and we shouldn't call it HLH because you don't really have an HLH. It's more like a macrophage activation syndrome. Yes, there are suicide genes. In fact, uh, the, the, some of the constructs, the allo constructs have rituxin and, uh, or cetuximab. We had two instances in an allo car. It's not yet published, not in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but in multiple myeloma. Uh, we had to use rituximab for patients because the HLH MAS is very severe. And uh, the NIH group in, uh, have also seen HLH and they, they just go with Anakindra, which is the IL-1 beta, but that has to be used very early and very high doses of that. So yes, there are suicide genes that are available. The, the, 
the, the thymidine kinase is another suicide gene which is used by the Baylor group. And you give uh, uh, one of this antiviral medications or even gancycluvir to knock off the, the product. So those are also uh, uh, design changes that are coming. Any more questions? Only one more question we'll allow. How far we are from allogenic CAR T cells uh, being FDA approved and available to other people? Good question, uh, Dr. Burani. I think we several car, allo CAR Ts are ongoing in uh, there are CD1920, dual, and if it's large B cell, we have a CD70 in, in uh, T cell lymphomas. Um, they are, I would say, at least a year or two away from approval, but there are many allo CAR products and many companies that are doing that. How much is the cost if the someone goes from here to US for a DLBCL car? That's a very good question. I think uh, so. The 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 you know the price tag for the car T's. It's anywhere from three hundred to four twenty five thousand dollars. The hospital co cost, uh, depending on which hospital you go to, uh, is another three hundred thousand dollars. So you're looking at a price tag of about five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars for a car T if somebody has to pay out of pocket. Uh, fortunately, the insurance covers a lot of this year. Dinesh, can I ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Swami, excellent talk. Uh, where are we with uh, NK cell cars? Is there any development? Good, good, great question, Dr. Malhotra. So we are doing uh, the NK cars. Uh, as you know, uh, MD Anderson, Katie Rizwani's work has been out licensed. So we work with Takeda. Mm -hmm. Takeda actually has bought the uh, license. So we are doing NK cars. That's a New England Journal paper from the first 20 patients. The first target is CD19. We're doing expansion studies. Uh, we have this in mantle. We have this in uh, various other malignancies, including T-cell with a CD5 target, but they're ongoing studies. 